there, drone fans. Rick here again from Drone Valley. In today's clip, I'd like to cover the proper care and feeding of your Mavic Pro battery. Now, I know that's a bit of a cheeky title, but I chose it on purpose because when I was going through the research on what I wanted to talk about with the cell, I realized a lot of the behaviors I'm going to recommend are very similar to what I do as a pet owner. And if you've got a dog at home or a cat or an iguana, you're probably like me and you're thinking through what makes them happy and comfortable and how best to feed them to provide the best life possible for those pets. Now, I know the battery's not a pet, but a lot of those behaviors translate to the battery. I also got a lot of questions from you guys about what's the best way to charge this and transport it, you know, and, and store it. So I thought, let me put a clip together that talks about all that stuff in one spot, make it easy for you to take care of these guys. The other aspect that isn't lost on me is that the battery is one of the most expensive accessories you're going to buy for the quad. Even though it comes with a battery, if you want to fly this thing a lot, you're going to need a second cell, a third cell, maybe even a fourth cell. And this is $90. This is $900. So almost 10% of the cost of the quad is in each battery you buy. So if you rack up three or four of these batteries, you've got 30% of an investment in these accessories in addition to the initial cost of the quad. And the big difference between this and this, this is built to be forever. I mean, the blades are gonna last a long time if you don't abuse them. The quad itself will stay together for a while. This guy isn't. This guy, the first time you charge it, a clock starts ticking, then there's an end state. So you're only gonna get a certain amount of charges and use out of this. And if you don't do things right with the battery, you can severely reduce the amount of useful life you get out of it, almost by 50% in some cases. So when I give you these rules to follow, if you don't follow the rules, the battery will work just fine, but it won't last as long. And that's really what it's all about because I'm a frugal guy, I'm a cheapskate, and I'm gonna squeeze every bit of toothpaste out of that tube before I replace it with another one. So anything I can do to sort of make sure that these batteries get as much airtime as possible is a good thing for me, and I hope you agree with that. All right, so before I get into the discussion about this uh, technology, let me talk about lithium polymer batteries first. So light bulb batteries have been around for a while. They're an incredibly powerful battery. The chemicals inside this provide, I think, the largest amount of energy per square inch of any cell out there today that's commercially available, it's certainly in the consumer space. It's the same level of technology that's powering the Tesla. So if you're driving a Tesla or know someone that does, those are lithium polymer batteries inside that Tesla. Now, that comes with blessings and curses. The curses are that the chemicals inside that battery are volatile. Now, as long as they're inside the battery, you're fine, but if they're exposed or they get mixed together, or if they come in contact with water or air in some cases, certainly conductive materials, there's the potential for fire because there's so much energy packed inside this battery that if it needs to release it quickly because it's got a short circuit, bad things are gonna happen. If you search on Google, you're gonna see a ton of YouTube videos where you've seen lipo fires, if this bursts into flame spontaneously combusts because of some kind of damage, that kind of fire burns incredibly hot and it'll burn till the chemicals are exhausted. So it's not a fire you want to contend with. It's not a fire you can even really put out. You can try with powder, you can't use water. So you're kind of sitting there watching this thing burn until the chemicals are expired. So you don't want to, you don't want to have a lipo fire. Now the good news is the DJI cells are protected against that in a lot of different ways. If you're flying a quad that's less expensive or an older quad, you may not have this type of battery. You have sort of a naked, I'll call it a naked lip, lipo cell that is really just the, the cells themselves wrapped inside of some type of protective cellophane, and it may be a single cell or multi-cell, but that's very easy to pierce. So the danger for that bursting into flames is a lot greater than say the DJI battery. Those are also not intelligent batteries. The, the standard lipo cells are like naked lipo cells, and they require the charger to be really smart so that it doesn't throw too much current into the battery. If you short the battery, you're gonna have problems. DJI is really protecting you against that by developing what they're calling an intelligent flight battery. And it's smart for a lot of different reasons. So some of the protections built in out of the gate, it's got a really hard exterior. So the cells that are inside here, and there's a, there's a grouping of cells in there, they're connected together and they act as one battery, but there's individual cells. You can't really get at those cells. So this hard exterior case really prevents you from sort of you know stabbing through it and hitting the batteries and causing short circuits and fires and things like that. So it's first line of defense is the case, which is great. The second line of defense is, I mentioned it's an intelligent flight battery. Inside this case, there's a smart controller. And the only job of that controller, its whole purpose in life, is to watch the cells and make sure they're being charged correctly, discharged correctly, make sure the charge is balanced across them, collecting all kinds of little bits of information about how they're performing, and then reporting that back to the controller. And there's a history built on that battery from the moment you power it up till your current flying time that tells the controller exactly the behavior of the battery. So what that means is if you're a knucklehead and you short out these contacts, that controller is going to spring into action and not allow that battery to burst into flames. If you use some kind of wacky third-party charger to try to charge it and you're trying to throw too much current at it, 
that controller is going to protect you and it's going to dial back that charging current to not damage the battery. If you try to use this thing or charge it or store it in temperatures that are too cold or too hot, that controller is going to again protect you from that, not allow you to charge it and go into a failure mode. So it's, it's built, I don't want to say to make it idiot proof because I'm an idiot on most days and I probably could find a way to damage it, but it's built to be consumer friendly, let me put it that way. So good on you DJI that you're taking the time to do that. Now I know I'm talking about the Mavic battery specifically, but a lot of what I'm talking about will apply to a Phantom battery and Inspire battery and a bunch of others, but you may have to look at their manuals to sort of relate what I'm talking about to those batteries, but a lot of the care and feeding does apply. All right, so enough about the lipo cell. What I will tell you before I get into the details too much deeper is the best thing you can do is to read the manuals. And I know that's a boring exercise. I hate to do it myself. And I know most of you, if you're flying for the first time, you want to charge this, slap it in the quad, go out back in the yard and put the thing up in the air. And I can't say I blame you because flying a quad is one of the coolest things you can do. So I get that. But what I'm saying is take the manuals, put them on your bed stand. Maybe some night when you're having a hard time falling asleep, open up the manuals and start reading. You'll get the details you need. But those manuals, both the owner's manual and the battery uh, user's manual have a lot of really good information. In it. And I'm gonna try and cover all I can here and give you some tips that I've discovered as well. But read those manuals because it'll echo a lot of the stuff I'm saying and it'll really protect that investment over the long term and keep it safe. All right, so as far as the battery goes, there's really two categories of behavior. There's good things you can do with the battery and there's bad things you can do with the battery. So I'll go through each of those individually and I'll talk about the good things first. So these are things that will help you protect the battery over the long term. The first thing is you wanna keep the battery very well protected when you're transporting and when you're using it. You wanna keep it more, most importantly dry and you wanna keep it at a reasonable temperature. And I'll go through those individually. So I fly with a lot of pilots and I know when you get out there and you're flying and it's the afternoon, you're trying to get that perfect shot and you've gotta come down and swap out a battery. I've seen a lot of guys pull the battery out, lay it down on the ground, put a new battery in and take off. And that's not a great idea because if moisture gets up inside these contacts or inside the casing, that moisture will cause mold and it can cause conductivity across these connections. Dirt can get in there. If dirt get in those contacts, then when you put it in the quad, it's gonna get transferred to those contacts. And even if it gets wet and there's, there's really no dirt in there, that water is gonna have certain contaminants in it, right, from the grass. And when the water evaporates, those contaminants are gonna stay on those copper connections. And copper is a wonderful connect, uh, conductor. And if you get contamination on there and it gets oxidized, it's gonna not conduct as well as it should, which means when I put it in the quad, even though it looks okay, it's not gonna conduct enough current to the quad, which can cause all kinds of flight issues for you. And again, remember this is a single point of failure. So over time, if that gets bad enough and it can't tra transfer enough of the current from the battery to the quad, that quad's coming out of the sky. So it's a super important thing to keep that dry and keep it clean. In addition to that, Another misbehaving thing I see people do is they'll pull a battery out of the quad and they'll charge it right away. And you never want to do that. You never want to charge a battery outside of the charging temperatures, especially when you first pull it out of the quad. So my rule of thumb is if you're going to fly an afternoon and let's say you have three batteries with you, when you come in and land the quad, if you pull a battery out of the quad, set it aside, take a fresh battery, put it in the quad and then put it back up. Don't charge that battery. Let that battery sit there. Then if you fly your quad for 15 or 20 minutes, when you land it the second time and you pull that battery out, this battery goes on the charger, that battery goes back on the table. So that way you're, you're rotating through the three batteries, but you want to give the battery enough time to come back down to some ambient temperature. Because if you're flying this thing, the chemical reaction inside the battery, both when it's charging and discharging, will heat up the battery. So the battery is naturally going to be warmer than the actual quad or the air around it. And you can really damage this thing if you charge it too cold or too hot. The battery doesn't like to take a charge outside of those temperature ranges. So never charge a battery warm. The other thing about storing a battery, this is something people trip over a lot. You never want to store a battery fully charged. Now this battery is fully charged. The only reason it's fully charged is when I'm done with this clip, I'm going outside and fly it. But if you're going to store this battery, I recommend storing it at 50% or less. So what I typically do, my rule of thumb is, I'll go out and fly for the day. When I come home, I'll take those batteries that I've used that day, put them right back in the case because they're all going to be discharged to 50% or less. Before I go out to fly that day, I charge my batteries. So what I'll do is that morning, I'll go over to the charger, I'll put the battery in the charger, go to my desk, get a cup of coffee, read my email, and those batteries are charged. And that way I leave with a set of fresh batteries and come home with a set of depleted batteries, and that's where I store them. If you don't do that, again, DJI springs into action. They've got the controller, which is watching those batteries. And if it doesn't see a discharge cycle, in 10 days, that's the default, it'll actually start trickling the discharge of those batteries, which means the batteries are gonna get warm, but they're protecting you against storing those batteries at 100%. And that's dangerous for a bunch of reasons. It, it will damage the lipo cells because if you keep them fully charged, 
they don't discharge as quickly or as well. They won't recharge to the same level. So you never want to store them charged. You only want to charge them before you use them and store them discharged. But that discharge cycle, that 10 day cycle, is something you can adjust in the software. And I'll show you how to do that in a couple of minutes. But just know that store them discharged. And if you don't, it's going to spring in action and discharge them for you. Okay. A couple of the things I talked about briefly were the temperature zones. Now, there are three critical thresholds you need to be aware of. The largest threshold is the use threshold, which means those are the temperatures between which you should operate the quad. And that is from a minus 10 degrees Celsius to a 40 degrees Celsius. So that's a nice wide range of temperatures that you can operate the quad. Now, can you fly the quad in colder temps or warmer temps? You absolutely can, but there could be weird behavior there, meaning it may not fly as long, it may not fly as reliably, you may see discharging happening quicker. So just know that if you're flying within those temperatures, which is kind of like comfortable temperatures to be outside, you'll be okay. Now, the, the next is the charging temperature, which is a smaller band. The charging temperature is from 5 degrees to 40 degrees. So you don't want to charge them in that cold environment. That can cause damage to the lipo cells by forcing current into them at a low temperature. Then the third temperature threshold is the storing temperature. It's super important that you respect that. You don't want to store these in a very cold environment or a very warm environment because damage is going to occur to the batteries. I've had people come up to me and say to me, hey, my battery swelled up. So they brought it to me and this end has popped out or this end has popped out. And I've said to them every time I say, where did you store it? And invariably, it's something like it was in my trunk, but it was only in there for a little while. It was in my glove box. But again, I only went in to fly and then I came back out. You can't store these things in hot temperatures because the chemicals inside are gonna to react to that heat and they're gonna puff up. And if they puff up, you gotta get rid of the battery. You can't, you can't use a battery if there's any kind of bulging on the bottom or bulging on the sides. You'll notice it here first, you'll probably notice it on the end, and they can bulge up to two or three times their size. They're about to burst at that point. When I say burst, I mean burst into flame. So store these in a very reasonable temperature. And the temperature zone is between 28, 28 on the high end and 22 on the low end. I know that seems like a very narrow band, so you can kind of cheat that a little bit, but certainly don't store these things in an outside shed. Don't store them anywhere near their sunlight. So if it's in direct sunlight, don't store them in your car. I'm, I'm pretty careful about if I go to dinner and I'm flying for the day and we go to dinner afterwards, at least taking the batteries out of the case and taking them into the restaurant with me, throwing them in a bag and taking them in because I want these to last a long time, but I really don't want them to burst into flame. So just be aware of those temperatures. And again, you probably can cheat a little bit, but I wouldn't cheat too much. Okay, so those are all good things to keep in mind. Some of the bad things. Um, if this does become damaged over time, so if you find that you've got any swelling and you can feel it if you run your finger along the bottom, it should feel flat and smooth, same thing on the back. If you notice any bubbling over here or any cracking of the case or expanding of the case, don't use that battery. You've got to get rid of that battery. You can't just take it and toss it in the trash. These are considered hazardous materials, so you have to go to a recycling center to get rid of LiPo batteries because, again, if you throw it in the trash, it gets compressed in the trash, that's going to burst into flames, and that's not good. So if you've got a swollen cell, as much as it kills you, you have to get rid of it and replace it with a new cell. And I've seen people that have brought them to me and said, well, it's only swollen a little bit. Don't use that cell. If I feel any kind of rippling on the bottom, I got to get rid of it. Not to mention the fact that if I do push my luck and put it in the quad and this bursts into flame, now I've not only lost a $90 battery, I've lost a $1,000 quad. So any bulging at all, get rid of it. Um, another thing I see people making a mistake on all the time is never insert a battery or remove a battery that's on. So right now it's off. You'll want to put it in the quad and turn it on in the quad. Before I pull it out, I'll turn it off. If you turn this thing on before it goes in the quad, these are energized. And the problem is that inrush of current to the quad can damage the quad. Because if you turn it on in the quad, so if it's in the quad and I turn it on, the controller is going to slowly ramp up that current and voltage so that it can sort of acclimate to the electronics inside there. If I just take it fully charged and slam it in the quad, that huge inrush of current, maybe not the first time, but over time will damage the circuitry. So never pull one out and never slam one in charge. And I've seen people do that again in their haste because they've come down and they want to get back up quickly. I've seen them pop out a battery that's on, have one fully charged and slam it in the quad. And every time I say to them, dude, you shouldn't be doing that, they'll come back and say, I've done it forever. I've never had a problem, but you don't know the kind of damage you're doing to the quad. So again, maybe I'm being super conservative, but don't do that. Stay away from that. That's a bad practice. Um, never charge the batteries unattended. That's a bad thing. And again, I know they're really well protected and I know DJI does a phenomenal job of building a really smart battery, but just the chance that that battery could go non-linear on you and burst into flames. That's not something you want to have happen in your house. So like with me, I charge them near my desk and I know we all have that corner in our house where everything is plugged in. Our laptops, our phones, everything we charge is plugged in. 
but don't put these on that table. Keep them near you when you're charging them because even though it's an infinitesimally small possibility that there's gonna be a problem, I wanna be close enough to it that I can react if I have to. So don't charge them unintended. Make sure you're at least within line of sight of that battery when you're charging it. And then the last thing I'll talk about are the terminals. And I know I've gone on a little bit about this already, but I can't stress this enough. The biggest danger to this battery, and it's not so bad on the Mavic, on the Phantom products it was worse because the connections were on the end, so people would set them down, but you have to constantly check these terminals for debris. And I don't always mean dirt and water. A lot of the cases that you'll be carrying these things in, especially the hard cases, and especially the ones that are less expensive, these sit in a foam section of that case. And you may put it in this way, right? And that foam on the less expensive cases, if you take your fingers and you, you rub them together like that on the foam, you'll find little bits of that foam coming off. That foam is non-conductive. It's an insulator. And if you slide this in there, and over time, because this thing's moving around inside that case, it scrapes off a little foam and it gets inside there, you're going to cause problems with the battery. So I've got a couple recommendations there. I'll talk about them in the tips and tricks section. But one thing I do is I carry a can of compressed air. And again, I know I'm a nerd. You probably don't have a can of compressed air. It's cheap. It's a couple of bucks at a computer store. You can order them from Amazon. But I use that and I blow out the terminals and I blow out these terminals before I fly for the first time. So when I get to a site, I pull the batteries out of my case, hit it with the compressed air, hit it with the compressed air, and then I go off and fly. And that way I'm sure if anything worked its way into the contacts, it's gone before I go and fly. And my batteries last a long time. So I think that's a really good thing to do. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is how do you keep track of the health of the battery? So these LEDs across the top are numbered and there's a diagram up there four through one, but they tell you a lot of information about the battery's health. So all of us know that if you hit this, you can read how fully charged the battery is. So again, 25%, 50, 75, and 100. But you also have a lot of other indications you can find out from there. So for example, when you're charging it, they'll light up again. So 25, 50, 75, 100. And if you get 25 charged, and you can see the next one blinking, you know you're moving on to the next 25 percentile till it's fully charged. Those are pretty basic things on most batteries. And they're helpful because if you're in a hurry to get out, you kind of have an idea like, do I need to fully charge it? Can I just go with an 80 percent charge battery? So those are great indicators. One you may not know about is the failure indicator. And that's the chart I have up now. The failure indicator lets you know that an error condition that has to be corrected has happened with the battery. And they're typically in one of three categories. It's either a charging failure, which means it's overcharged or it's undercharged, a, uh, an, a current failure, which means I had an inrush of current that was excessive or an excess of current that came out of the battery, which typically happens with a short circuit. Then the third category has to do with temperature. You've either tried to charge the battery where it's too cold or too warm, and it's gonna warn you about that. But those, those failure indicators, that chart will tell you exactly what's wrong. Now, some of those, you can just let the battery sit. So if it's a temperature warning, let the battery sit. When it reaches an ambient temperature, you can charge it again. But some of the others, like a short circuit or an overcurrent condition when you're charging it, may require other action. Now, most times, the way you can fix that, and this is a trick that I've learned, is you can let this discharge all the way. So basically fly it till you get down 5%, put it on the ground, just leave it sit out there until the battery goes blank. Now, you'll never do that with a standard LiPo. You'll hear people say all the time, never let a LiPo discharge completely because LiPo batteries, once they discharge completely, there's no bringing them back. In most cases, they're gone for good. There's no zombie effect where I can charge them and get them back. You can't really discharge this 100% because again, the intelligent flight controller, even though it doesn't light up and it looks like it's dead, there's still eight or 10% of residual power inside here that the controller is not letting get out. So a good way to reset the battery is to discharge until it's dead. Once it's dead, you can put it back on the charger. And what that does is kind of reset all the metrics inside the battery. So the controller at that point says, okay, I'm gonna hit that big clear button and start from scratch and it'll actually bring the battery back to life. And it'll, in a lot of cases, it'll correct those error conditions. Another thing that's good for is if you notice through the application, I'll show you how to check that in a minute, if one of the cells is charging better than the others, and maybe one isn't charging as well as the others, to reset that metric, same thing, you let it actually deplete. So fly it till it's down to five or 10%, land it, let it sit out there in the grass in the shade. When it's finally dead, then you can recharge your battery and you're good to go. So those are kind of where you're going with the battery indicators. The next section I want to talk about is using the app. Now the DJI Go app gives you a tremendous amount of information on the health of your batteries, how many times they've been charged, the serial numbers, what the cells look like, and there's some parameters you can adjust inside that application to your liking, and I'll give you some recommendations on that. So hang on and I'll go over that in a second. The DJI Go application provides a tremendous amount of information about your battery's health and allows you to make certain adjustments that govern how your batteries behave while flying. Now to access the battery section of the application, on the upper right hand corner you'll see three dots. If you tap those dots, it'll bring up the main general settings page. 
Those icons on the left-hand side indicate the different sections in the application. About two-thirds of the way down, you'll see a battery icon. If you tap that, it'll take you into the main battery settings page. Now this page has got a lot of information and I'll go through it pretty slowly. On the top of the screen, you can see there are three cells. Inside the physical battery, there really are three separate cells that are connected together. What this is showing you is the potential amount of power left in each one of those cells. Now that's important because you want to make sure those three cells charge evenly. If you find one of those cells is lower than the other two, you've got to do a reset procedure on the battery to correct for that. To the right of that is the voltage of that battery, and to the right of that is the temperature of the battery. That's a really good metric to look at. If you've been flying your quad on a hot day, maybe you've landed it, and you want to put it back up in the air. You just want to check that temperature to make sure it's not excessive and you can fly. Below that, you've got the remaining power for the overall battery versus what its total capacity is. And to the right of that is the times the batteries have been charged. Now, this is a brand new battery, so I've only had zero charges on it. It's the first time I've actually charged the battery. Below that is a critically low battery warning, and below that is the low battery warning. Those kind of work hand in hand, and I normally keep my low battery warning at 30%, and I'll put the critical low battery warning typically at 20%. Again, this is a new battery. I haven't done the adjustment yet, but those are totally up to you. And what those two settings dictate is when your controller starts yelling at you that you should pay attention to your quad because you might run out of power if you don't return to home soon. The smart word turn to home function just below that gives control of the quad to the quad. So if you're flying this thing and you fly it out so far that the battery is getting critically low where it can't return on its own, having that setting on will force the quad to return to home. I think that's a really safe thing to do and I always recommend leaving that on. Below it is the flight time on the battery. Now it's at zero because I haven't flown with this battery and I'm just using it for an example here. Below that is the advanced settings tab. Now if you click that advanced settings tab, that'll take you to another menu where you can make further adjustments. So the first thing you'll notice on the advanced settings tab is the show voltage on main screen uh, toggle. Now I have it off right now because that puts too much information on the main screen for me. But if you turn that on in the on position, what you'll notice if you go back to the main screen is you now actually have the battery voltage up top. A lot of people like to have that up there. I like a less cluttered screen, so I don't turn that on that often. Below that, you've got a time to discharge choice. Now, it's set at 10 days as the standard discharge, and I talked earlier in the clip about if you leave the batteries alone, they'll actually force themselves to discharge over a period of time. That's where you set it. So right now it's set for 10, but you can dial that back to anything you want. I usually cut that in half and dial it back to five days. You can go even lower if you want, but I think a good rule of thumb is you're not going to have problems if you let it go 10 days and discharge, but I don't like to leave the battery fully charged that long, so I typically pick five days. The last is the details tab. Now, if you tab that, you'll notice right away that you've got a general status of the battery, so it's telling it's normal. If there was an error condition with the battery, it would give you more details here of what that error condition was. And down the bottom, you've got the serial number of the battery and the total number of times the battery has been charged. That may seem strange, but each of the batteries that are sold are serialized. And that's to, I guess, protect you if the battery's lost or if you have to send it back for service. And they can kind of track too, if there's a series of batteries that have issues, they can usually track that back to a serial number range. So again, a lot of information, a lot of it you may never look at, but it's important to know that it's there in case you need it someday. In this last section, I wanted to pass along some of the tips and tricks that I've developed over the years, flying these quads as often as I do. Now, some of these will answer questions that I get on the channel. Other things I'm going to talk about are maybe accessories that I use with the quad to protect the batteries and extend their life. One of the most popular questions I get on the channel, especially in the winter, is can I fly in cold weather? A lot of people want to fly in cold weather and they want to know what can I expect if I fly in cold weather. I live in the Northeast and we get some pretty brutal winters, so there's a couple of months where it's freezing cold outside and you guys know I love flying my quad. So any day I can be out there and put that thing up in the air is a good day for me. So unless it's a blizzard or it's raining heavy or there's really high winds, I want to be outside flying. So I fly a lot in the cold weather. Your biggest enemy in the cold weather is your battery. The battery is extremely temperamental, not so much on the high end of the temperature scale, but on the low end of the temperature scale. And what I find is if you make the mistake of going out in a warm car, putting a battery in your quad and flying it for 20 minutes and then coming back to your car and trying to pull a battery out of that case, your car has cooled down quite a bit and those batteries are starting to suffer. So they're not gonna be behaving the same way they would if they were warmer. So what I do when I'm out on a cold day is I'll take all my batteries, I wear a big winter jacket, and I'll slide them into the inside pockets of my, of my jacket, and that way they're up against my body. My body temperature kind of keeps the batteries at an ambient temperature, so I can pull out a warm battery, pop it in the quad, fly. When it lands, take that battery out, put it in my pocket, pull another fresh one out, and fly. I've even flown with pilots that have used 
I don't know if they're hunting jackets or fishing jackets, but they're, they're kind of vests that go underneath their big jacket and they have pockets all up and down the front and they'll keep their batteries loaded up in those pockets to keep them against their body. So it, it pretty much ensures that you're taking a battery out that is in that kind of Goldilocks zone of temperature that'll fly the best it can. Another behavior you're gonna find in cold weather, and this has happened to me a bunch, is that normal flight times, you'll have what's called, I call it a linear um, discharge cycle, which means your discharge rate and your flight time will kind of mirror each other. So if you're up for 10 minutes and it's gone down 50%, you fly another 10 minutes, it's gonna go down the rest of the 50%. So you can kind of track how much battery life you've got left based on how long you've been flying. I don't find that to be true in cold weather. I find a kind of a peculiar behavior where maybe the first 80% of the battery, battery I get that linear uh, discharge rate, but if I get down to like 75% or 60% of the battery, I found it can go from 60% charge to 40% charge very, very quickly. So I've learned that when I'm flying in cold weather, the first thing I'll do is put it up and fly as far out as I want. And then when I start seeing it get to 70 or 80%, I'll bring it in closer so that if it does go through that wacky 60 to 40 change, I can land it pretty quickly because I don't want to get into a panic situation where it's a couple you know, thousand yards away from me and I have to land it someplace away from me that I don't have a mat in the snow. So just be aware of that. It doesn't happen every time to me, but I think the combination of the cold wind rushing through that cooling fan behind the lens may cool it down to the point where the battery starts getting a little bit wonky. So just be aware of that. The next thing I'll talk about, and I talked about this earlier in the clip, has to do with the resetting of this. I consider that a grooming exercise. So for me, every six months or so, I'll discharge the battery completely. You can do it as often as you want, but I discharge it completely by flying the quad to 5% of its battery life, letting it land, and letting it sit there till the battery dies. Now, again, I'd mentioned before, the battery doesn't actually die. There's still a residual amount in the cells, but it resets all those counters. And I think that's a healthy thing because it kind of corrects for, it's like confession, it corrects for all the misbehaviors of the last six months. It levels everything out, it starts fresh. It gives me a kind of a big clear button that I can hit to make sure all the metrics that have been collected on those cells are erased and we start fresh. And that's super important because if you look at the application like I showed you a minute ago, and one of those cells is not charging as quickly as the other cells, the only way to reset that parameter is to do that reset of the battery. So for me, that's kind of a grooming exercise. I would recommend that once or twice a year just to get your battery in tip top shape so you can start off fresh. The next one is the debris. I talk about this a lot because I see it a lot. I'm a bit of a pain in the neck. Like if you fly with me, I'm watching how you're flying. I'm a bit of a nerd that way. And I wanna see what you're doing different than what I'm doing. And one thing I love to do is to take a look at everybody else's batteries just to see if there's junk in there and if they're all nicked up and banged up. Because again, these are amazing little devices, but you gotta take care of them. And that debris getting in the end can cause you a ton of problems on this guy and especially in the phantoms because those battery connections are way inside the quad so i'm always looking inside there to see if stuff's in there and it's getting gunked up and stuff carry a toothbrush with you i know it sounds extreme or when you're home rub the toothbrush across there to knock any loose dirt out hit it with the compressed air but just protect these things don't set them down on dirty surfaces and make sure that they're nice and clean and that's going to ensure all the power that's in the battery that's needed by the quad can be delivered when it's needed by the quad. So that's just a, a little tip there and I'll show you an accessory to help with that. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is visit your cells often. <laughs> it sounds wacky to say it that way, but I have friends that fly and sometimes you get excited about flying and then you get busy and you put your quad in the case and it goes in a closet and you forget about it. If these guys discharge completely, because remember, you can discharge them to eight or 10%, but if you let them sit after that, those cells will naturally discharge on their own and those internal cells get to zero. I don't know of any way to recover that. Now I know there's a couple of hacks on the web where you can crack open the case and you can force charge them. I'm not a big fan of doing that, but maybe if you're desperate, that's the way to go. But you can prevent that just by visiting your cells. So put a calendar note in your phone that dings every six months to say, go check your cells. Because if you're six months and you haven't checked your cells, there's a chance they could have discharged to the point where they're dead. The worst thing that could happen is you pop open that case expecting to charge them to fly and none of those cells recover because you're now out $400 or close to it with the cells and you can't fly that afternoon. So visit your cells often. Every, every six months or every three months, open up the case, charge them, discharge them, fly your quad, have fun with it. You bought it to have fun, so get out there and fly it. All right, the last thing I'll talk about is some of the accessories. So first of all, we sell a lot of stuff on the channel. You can find this stuff anywhere. I'm just going to talk about it. But if you want to buy it, I'll put links below. You can find it from us. If you need cells, I have a really good deal on cells right now. It's only going to be a limited time because I only got a case and a half of them. But I have a $5 off coupon below. So instead of it being $89, it's $84. Bucks. And again, if you want to buy them from me, that's great. You get a discount. A couple of bags I use for the batteries. So I have a standard bag that's just a protective bag. If I'm using the cell, I'll throw it inside there. 
and that guarantees in addition to the plastic that's protecting it this is a really good way to protect the cell so if i'm going out for the afternoon maybe i'm using those small portable cases that i did a clip on a while back this allows me to put a battery or two inside this case close it up and carry it with me it's a very inexpensive way to protect your battery provides a lot of shock proof uh, protection there this is a lipo battery a safety battery bag and it's built specifically for the mavic so it's small enough where you can actually pop it open and this is a great way to transport your battery so you can slide your battery inside there close it up and it gives you not only the protection from piercing the battery like this guy does but it's also fire retardant which means god forbid something happens with the battery inside of here it's going to minimize the amount of damage the battery is going to do to the surrounding area the last thing I'll point out are these battery guards. Now these are pretty new and they're made out of a rubbery surface material and basically they fit right over the battery. So you can stick it on the battery like this and it covers up, it's flexible, it covers up the connections on the battery so they're not exposed. So when I travel, I have that on, I slide it in a bag and I take it with me. When I'm gonna fly, I pull that off. There's also a companion piece that fits on the quad. So this one slides over the battery connections in the quad. And you can see on there, it covers those battery connections perfectly. And that's a great, Thing to do because I don't transport it with the battery in the quad. I don't like to do that. Uh, that'll sit in the quad. I'll put it in my case and that keeps it clean and keeps that foam from getting inside there that I talked about a little while ago. When this one's on, you don't have to worry about this thing getting dirty inside your case because if I slide this down inside my foam, there's no way foam's going to get inside there. And that, to me, that's the biggest reason of failure that I've seen with quad flyers that I fly with other pilots. So anyway, that's just a couple accessories you can use. And again, I have links below if you want to buy them from us. You can find them on Amazon, wherever you want to go. I just want to point them out because I use them and I find them to really protect the battery and protect the quad. I think it's a good thing. So that's all I really had for today. I'm hoping that this clip makes a lot of sense to you. I hope I didn't go on too long, but I feel like the battery, again, being the most expensive accessory you're going to buy is something you really know how to need to know how to take care of. And hopefully I gave you the information you need to do that. If you have any questions, again, drop them in the comments below. I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. I'm doing my best. Um, and I've got links below for this kind of stuff. Um, thanks an awful lot for watching. I'm really enjoying doing these clips and I'm hoping you guys are finding them helpful. As long as you're enjoying them, like I always say, I'll keep doing them. So thanks again for watching today and uh, happy flying.